pedagogical practices, that's the art and science of our work. It's our craft. And if we're really honest, we don't talk about it very much. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start off with a lie. I'm not Max Drummy. <laughs> Max Drummy's my colleague, and he's based in Seattle. There's a little nimble team um, that is working on this um, deep learning work. Michael Fullen was mentioned, Joanne McKechn and Joanne Quinn. The three of them are global directors, and Max and I are folks that um, support the learning at the classroom, school, and, and uh, district level. And so Mary's right, we've been all around um, getting in there and um, getting to know folks and how they're thinking about the deep learning work. It's been really super exciting. And so today is a chance for us to be exposed to this work and as well give you a chance to process and think about the work that's going on. It's a real pleasure to be here. So the world's kind of crazy right now. It's a little, hey, a little complex and there's a lot happening. Um, certainly some climate stuff going on perhaps and there's some social political stuff going on and there's, oh, some technological changes happening too. Our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he said the other day, he said, you know, technology has never changed as fast as it's changing now but it will never be this slow again, which is kind of a great way to frame it. That it seems as though all of these changes are happening before our eyes, and as educators, we care about our kids, and we're wondering, how do we support them through these changes, and how do we prepare them for a world we can barely imagine? And so that's what this work is about, is um, trying to get our collective heads around that. And so there's this movement afoot, and it's exciting because it's really at the grassroots level. It's, um, it celebrates um, the good work, the conscientious, um, mindful, caring work that so many teachers um, do on a day-to-day -day level. And it celebrates and, and um, brings forward that work on a global level. There's a lot of optimism and hope around this work. And, and there's this collective sense that together, we can really make a difference for kids. And so this has been a pretty exciting time, um, especially when the world has been a little bit unpredictable. Want you to think about um, what you're about to see. And I want you to Watch what's happening for kids in this video and come up with one word that you think captures what you're seeing. So our team was tasked with designing a wearable robotic suit. Our project is a hand washing station for use in rural Malawi. The Houston Zoo asked us to build an enrichment device for the giant anteaters. So the class is an introduction to engineering design. Each of the teams is working on a client-based project. So there's an individual or a group in the community, such as the Houston Zoo or NASA, that have a particular problem that they need solved. <laughs> I think that you're going to need something besides passive gravity to get this to seal back up. So the question is, what could you use to do that? So the students began prototyping only about a week ago. By starting with these really kind of easy to work with materials, the students can go fast and test many ideas figure out which one works, and then they move on to the higher fidelity materials. Over 50% of all diseases contracted in Malawi are waterborne illnesses that could be prevented by having a hand washing regularly. And so our project aims to create a station that kind of makes up for the physical lack of equipment that rural Malawi has. 
Well, right now we're working on a prototype for the giant anteaters. They live in their enclosure and there's not too much for them to do all day. So we've built a die that has a bunch of different holes in it that we can put food in. So as humans begin to do further exploration in space, they're gonna be spending a long time with robots. So we're designing a suit in order to test these human-robot interactions. During the second half of the semester, they actually prototype their solutions, build, test, and iterate, so that by the end of the semester, they should have a working design that meets the goals that were set at the beginning of the semester. We are um, working in about 1,000 schools, probably more uh, at this point, in seven countries. And our work is about transformation. It's about taking a lot of the great work, and there's lots of great work happening in schools, and collectively thinking about how can we add innovation and creative thinking to this learning process so that we help to, to prepare students for a world that's really hard to imagine. We're in seven countries right now, and in each of those countries, the work is expanding. I'm from Canada, and um, we are, from, we are uh, in coast to coast uh, in, in new pedagogies for deep learning. In the United States, currently we work with Connecticut, I'm gonna go from east to west, Connecticut, Michigan, um, Idaho, Washington, and California. And we look forward to having more partners participate in this really exciting work. So what we do is we um, situate opportunities for students to learn deeply, learning that matters. And you can see in the middle of that comment there, there's this notion of learners contributing to the common good. That's the exciting part of this work is that what we're finding as we're learning this together is that yes, students are taking on some very exciting projects and engaged in some really meaningful and um, interactive classroom communities. But what they're doing with it is that they're recognizing that their learning can make a difference and can support others locally and globally. And that's like a hook for students. All of a sudden, they feel as though they matter, that their learning matters, and that they really feel like they can be an agent for change. And that is the stuff that makes this work so meaningful, not only for the kids, but for us as educators. We get so excited by that. And it taps into something deep in us that says, this is why I signed up for this gig in the first place. So this is our work that we're doing together. And the way we're doing it, I think, is the most exciting of all, is because while I may be standing here in a suit, and, and certainly Michael Fullen is considered a real guru around this work, we're all learning, and we're all um, sharing our expertise. So nobody's cornered the market on how to do this. Instead, we're just rolling up our sleeves at the teacher, principal, district level, and we're throwing our ideas into the hopper. We're taking risks. We're testing out ideas, we're tweaking them as we go, and we're, we're seeing if it's making a difference, and then we share it with each other. It's really a new way of working, in that at the classroom, school, system, and global level, we're all participating in this massive collaborative inquiry where we're sharing the best we've got, and somebody picks it up and tries to make it even better. And so it's a wonderful professional engagement that we're, we're participating in, and it couldn't be more exciting. So what I'd like you to do is watch this video and ask yourself what possibilities you see for students. What are they learning? At Canterbury Primary School today, we're hosting Young Lions of the Future Expo, where three schools have come together, Chatham Primary, Ringwood North Primary and Canterbury, to do a project all about the future. We each have to research a problem 
and then create something to solve it. Seeing all these amazing inventions everywhere is awesome. The community's really been great. We've had over 50 people come to our store so far. I've seen so many cool things from little juice cups to feeding the homeless to transportation, things like our idea. We've even seen around the world subways. So this is the automatic dog feeder. You'd set the timer as for three o'clock, as you can see with the wires in there. And then as the day would go past, it hit that, which sent the current through, and then the dog food would fall down. I thought of it because both my parents go to work and we go to school, and my dog's always left outside at home and she usually just sleeps, so at night she's up. I think it would be really great for the owners and also their pets' lives and their relationships between each other. Our idea is a sober sensor, which basically is a steering wheel that will scan for drugs and alcohol through the sweat. As to why we want this is to uh, contribute to the Towards Zero Fund, which is an initiative that will hopefully stop drink driving on the roads and make sure that less people die on our roads. I decided to make the light pot because I love plants and water and all the beautiful things in nature and I don't want it to disappear. This will help people look after their plants better and also save water. It shows when your plants is, is not watered because there's no energy in the dirt. So the light won't go on. But when it's wet, the light will go on. To show this plant is watered, you don't need to water it anymore. We decided to make cricket flower cookies because the population growth on Earth is really fast. Livestock's just not that sustainable. Cows are one of the largest producers of methane on Earth and methane can contribute to greenhouse gases. However, insects don't let out any methane, so they can reduce greenhouse gases. So when we found out that in the United States alone, there were 4,000 drownings between 2005 and 2014, we thought we had to do something. So we invented a drone that flies over your head and drops a life buoy to save you. So while the lifeguards come and swim out to you, um, you're floating there ready for them. Just walking through this small exhibition, looking at all the new inventions, it really just makes you think, oh, that's a good idea and that could help me every day. And like some of them are really cool and I could get and find them really helpful. Events like Young Minds of the Future is important because it's a chance to work with other people from other schools and hear other people's ideas. We believe that most of these ideas will make it into the real world. If not, they will be considered and people will know about them. It shows kids creativity and it lets people have their own point of view. In Young Minds of the Future, we didn't really have a standard. We didn't have to make a certain thing. We got to do basically anything that we thought would change the world and I find that really interesting. We've seen a couple of videos now where students are really engaged and they're excited. They're feeling very hopeful about their work. Some of them are saying, I believe this is going to be on the market someday. You know, that confidence. It's, it's, it's really quite exciting to see kids feel that way about learning. And so what this work is about is about building, developing, enhancing skills that can support students no matter what direction they take. In a world that's hard to imagine, what skills will they need into the future? And so we have got those six global competencies. Sometimes we call them the six C's, global competencies. They're there on your table, and they're also in your book. They're um, on a couple of pages here, so you can reference them. And the page looks like this. So we've, we've recognized that the kids are responding and they're feeling as though they're connecting with the learning and we want them to have that emotional connection. And we can do this by engaging them in these six competencies. Four of these competencies have been around for a long time and we used to call them 21st century fluencies, creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. We're really familiar with those. We've been working on them since the late 1900s. 
have a, have a read through those six competencies and spe pay special attention to two of those C's, character and citizenship. <laughs> Some of you may be um, thinking, well, what's the right answer? Which competency is more important than the other? And I think there lies the problem we have in education, is that we've all been kind of conditioned, and sadly we inadvertently condition our students to look for one answer. And often there is no answer, or the answer is really informed by our context, or our values, or our perspectives. And so, this work is really about getting our heads and hearts around complexity and that this isn't about a checklist and it's not about a plan and having it perfect. It's about being really comfortable with ambiguity and complexity and knowing that there's a whole whack of people that are trying to do the same good work you are without having clear, neat and tidy answers. And so we would argue all of those competencies are important and um, that together, when, when they're situated in a classroom, we see some very exciting outcomes for students. If you take a look at some of your curricula, and I mean go into the real nitty-gritty, go into the detailed language in the curriculum, you will see some of the verbs that sound a lot like these competencies. And so we're not too far off in terms of how we are situating learning for students. We're building on good work that's already been happening, and we are um, making it transparent. The beauty of these six C's is that for a long time we would argue about what creativity is like and I'd have one definition and you'd have another and we would assume that we were speaking the same language but we weren't. And so it's the clarity and it's the precision of these six C's that help us to come together and have richer conversations about what student learning looks like. I want to talk a little bit about those other two C's, character and citizenship. Because Michael Fodlin would say, these two have been the game changers. The four have been around for a while, but when you add the two, when students feel connected to the work, they feel um, a sense of ownership of the learning. They, it's a natural next step for them to say, and what are we going to do with it? How are we going to make a difference? And we see regularly now students as young as kindergarten and all the way through to grade 12 taking that learning and deciding as a class or as a group Let's make a difference for, and it can be small at a local level, it could be just helping out another class, and it could be global. And we've seen a range. And the beauty is the kids own it. They own that learning. Recently, I was, I'm participating in doing some video editing uh, for the Ministry of Ontario in, in Ontario. And I had this cheeky kid, right, that we we're filming. <laughs> you know, he's one of those grade eight kids, right? He's got a little bit of an attitude. And he looks right at the camera and he says, I don't see why we're learning it if we're not going to do anything with it. Which is really honest. And you know what? That's what a lot of them are thinking, but many of them are too much into compliance mode to say it. Right? So it's that character and citizenship that gives this work its magic. It's the helping humanity work. 
And so what we're going to do now, now that you're acquainted with those six C's, is I want you to watch a video and see if you can locate these six C's in action. In kindergarten, we've been learning about birds, and we just recently finished our celebration of learning with our exhibition night. Our celebration is a great opportunity for families to really get an idea of what their kids can do. Climbing helps it to stay onto the tree. The water drains out, but the food still goes in. Wow. To begin our celebration, we took on the role of performer and we sang songs for our friends and family. And then we came to the role of scientists where we um, presented our research and scientific songs to our audience. fish, crayfish, insects, Every student shared their work using a presentation board. The role of the boards for the students uh, became a way for them to be cued for their presentation, it's to show some of their work, and to have an up close and personal out, interactive experience no with their audience. Wow. Now you have to guess what kind of feed it has. Well, if, can I guess what kind of feed it has? So if it eats fish, I bet it's got web feet. No, you're not right. It has love. And then we hey, moved into the role of artists, where we got to have a guy who walked around the place. Getting kids ready for a night like this happens all year long. Kindergartners researched an individual bird, and they researched that bird with a sixth grade buddy. Female with the red dog. They collected information together specifically on one bird. Over the course of the year, we use bird journals. We invite domesticated birds into our classroom that we can handle. We incubate eggs in an incubator. We hatch the chicks. We go into the field, visiting places that are working directly with birds. The kids went through four to five drafts of their bird, and we develop a really simple rubric to help them with their scientific drawing. Their research and artwork are all gonna be put together on a note card, and then those are sold to the community and the uh, money that's collected from those note cards are put towards Idaho rehabilitation and conservation efforts. As we get closer to the evening, we begin to think about specifics, about what does a presenter and a performer look like? What are the skills that are needed for that? We practice presenting to each other, to small groups, to the whole class, and then sometimes to the other class, kids that we don't know very well. Its wingspan is eight inches. I hadn't been learning a lot about how much it lays, but um, Angela, can you check that? Yeah, so we can five to ten. Five to ten eggs. Celebrations are an opportunity for us to invite are the people that we've worked with all year, the experts we've worked with, the people that have come into the classroom, and the people we've been out to see. What does she do? She's on the nest with her. I got involved with ANSWER because we help start a program called Bird by Bird, where we provide bird watching equipment and act as citizen scientists. So take real data and be a part of this global database that tracks birds. We came back to the exhibition tonight to support um, the 34 kids I've been working with all year. For me to walk around and see all this beautiful watercolor artwork and to see all the kids um, present their birds and as real scientists, um, they did a phenomenal job. If it builds it ne its nest on the shore, it builds a ramp up to it with sticks, so it just walks out of the water and goes to its home. That sounds like a very smart bird. It very is. It's really fun to watch those kids that wouldn't even raise their hand at the beginning of the year. Now they're in front of two families that they don't even know, and they're sharing everything in a very proud way. Length is 24 centimeters. It's song. I can probably imitate it for you. Okay. It's like... <laughs> 
this evening of celebration really proves and shows that they can do it and how hard they've worked and all the things that they've learned. I think that's what that celebration does for them, is it, it really just like solidifies that they can do it and that they can do anything. The fact that they stand up and present in a manner that I did in college for the first time, it's pretty amazing. It's, it makes a parent really proud. I could tell they felt good and they felt proud and they felt like they knew their stuff. I mean, they were the experts. Having a shared definition of these global competencies is really, really important. And it helps not just to clarify for ourselves when we're collectively examining student work or their performance, but as well it clarifies for parents and students about what we're expecting and it brings them into the game. What we recognized though was that just having merely these definitions wasn't enough. It didn't provide enough specificity and precision so that we know that if we can um, provide really, really specific feedback to students, they understand their next step. And so we created these uh, learning progressions for each one of those competencies. This is part of a collaboration learning progression, and it's only part of one. So for each um, competency, we have about four or five dimensions that precisely describe that competency. And then you can see that we have a continuum that shows the natural development of that dimension as students grow. And what's terrific about this is that this allows us as professionals to have really meaty conversations not highfalutin ones, but really meaty conversations about students and their performance. And we can do that while looking at their work. It provides us with clarity about what might be their next step in their learning. We have these in student and parent friendly language as well. So students are active learners and can understand what their next step might be. It's a powerful tool as well because we find that teachers can understand and assess where students are at and then they can respond and design their lessons knowing where students need to grow. And so it's a very, very powerful tool. We know, though, that classrooms like that kindergarten class, it's just not going to happen naturally, right? We need to provide clarity about the kind of conditions that support deep learning. And so we have broken it into four elements. And there's a table card that shows those four elements as well, if that's helpful for you. So in order to enable the deep learning, we describe four elements. The first one is pedagogical practices. And while this pie may show four equal parts, I believe the pedag pedagogical practices, that's the art and science of our work. That's a huge part of our work. It's our craft. And it's what we collectively need to make better understanding of as we move forward. It's the biggest part of the work. And if we're really honest, as Mary said earlier, we don't talk about it very much. And yet, what we're learning about the brain and what we know about social influences and behaviors and what we know about child development and what we know about cognition, we're realizing this is pretty complex, this pedagogy thing. And so we need to talk about it. No more imposter syndrome. No more of this, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want anyone to know that I don't really understand success criteria, right? And we do that, right? We totally do that. We all do that. But this work is about saying comfortably, I have no idea. 
I'm willing to be vulnerable and I'm really good with asking a question because this is complex work ped pedagogy is and until we all get our heads around it and learn and continue to learn we're not going to be able to create those amazing classroom environments we've already seen. So pedagogy is a big piece of this. And so in our framework, we clarify and make sense of what does it mean to have learning goals and success criteria? What does a rich learning design look like that allows these six C's to thrive? And how about peer feedback, regular feedback? What does that look like and how can that support the learner. So we spend a lot of time when we're learning together on pedagogy. That's a really important element. The second thing we know is that it's the learning partnerships, the nature of the relationships in the classroom that really make a difference for students. Teachers have a ton on their shoulders. They can't possibly be expected to be an expert in everything anymore. It's an unfair expectation. A hundred years ago when all the authority was, you know, in between a leather bound book and we could go there, that was different. So the teachers were the sage. But now there's so many truths and so many realities and perspectives. How could we as teachers possibly be expected to know everything? So we have to shift the way we think about our role. And instead of being the all seeing, all knowing, all everything person, we need to shift to a position which says, I don't know, I'm a learner too. Let's find out where do you think we should go first with our questions, which is a very different role for a teacher. It's an activator role. It it acknowledges that all of us are learning and we can't possibly know all the answers. And back to that ambiguity thing, we got to get really comfortable not knowing. And we got to get way more comfortable asking questions. And the more we as teachers ask questions and invite questions rather than answers, the students will continue to ask questions. We've all seen it. If you raise children, you know, they stop asking questions by about grade five and grade six. And we've, we've seen it in the research, haven't we? That those questions, they stop, they shut down. That curiosity, they, they receive signals from us in society that, that suggest asking questions is not good. So we need to flip the culture a bit. Invite questions, invite curiosity. Not be an expert, be okay with it. Not worry about the imposter syndrome. So it's about inviting different perspectives into the classroom because you can't do it all. You just represent one minor, narrow part of the society. Bring in lots of different backgrounds, lots of different people with expertise. And you know what? They love it. They love to come in. They go back to the office or back to the shop, they brag to their peers, you know where I was today. I was invited into a grade two classroom. Mm -hmm. They're happy to support. Mm -hmm. And it's not only face-to-face -face support, but we see a lot more interaction now with Skype, where there's this um, terrific site, I don't know if you know it, it's called VROC, V-R-O-C. And, and you can connect with university professors from all over the world. So if you're studying pale paleontology or some kind of rock formation or some virus, chances are there is a university professor that's happy to Skype with you. How fabulous is that, right? That students get these relevant, thoughtful, diverse views in their classroom. So it's, it's about that. And it's about how can we make those partnerships rich to, to um, enhance the learning experience. But it's also about what kind of relationships do we have within the classroom? Do students feel like they belong when they come in? Are they critical members of that community? 
And how do we treat each other when we're in that classroom? Is there a sense of equity? Does every student matter? And so how do we create those kinds of opportunities so that all students feel as though they have voice and they have choice? Of course, you can't talk about partnerships without talking about the parents. They are so good about our hot dog days. Way to go. How can we get parents talking about what's happening in the classroom? They want to have those rich conversations at the dinner table rather than what they normally get, which is, what'd you learn at school today? Nothing, right? They want to have those conversations. They want to know what's going on in, in the curriculum and they want to assist and support. Many of them have awesome, awesome intentions. So how can we bring them in to the discussion around classroom? Not just what happens before school and after school, but within that de school day. So that's all about partnerships and how can we rethink our relationships within our classrooms and be okay with it. Learning environments. So what does our classroom feel like? Is it interactive? Is it flexible? I remember one principal, and I've done this work of, um, for a while. He said to me, you know, I used to walk into a class, and if I saw a kid learning on the floor, like reading, I'd say, get up off the floor. But now, I'm realizing, that's where he chose to, that's where he chose to read and learn. He's, he's engaged, he's working on it, that's where he's comfortable. So now I just ask the caretakers to make sure they really sweep up. It's that rethinking our learning environments. How can the students own the classroom? How can it be theirs to contribute? And it's not just the classroom, we see in schools, learning spilling out into the hallways and other places and outside. And how can we not be afraid to take kids outside without filling in the 150 field trip forms, which I know can be onerous. But we know that place and context triggers memory, triggers excitement. So how can we optimize those learning environments in a way that engages all kids? And once again, how do we create norms in our community so that everybody feels as though, as though they have a voice and they matter? They matter. Each student matters. Our fourth element is leveraging digital. So, this is a tough one for many of us because we're in a situation now where they've got these devices that are anatomically connected to their bodies. And if we're really honest, they're anatomically connected to us too, right? We've got to be honest. And so how do we engage students? And this is a little provocative. You're not going to like me for this one. But how do we engage students so that Leveraging digital is authentic and meaningful and actually accelerates the learning rather than distracts from the learning. That's the big question for people. They figure they're getting on there and they're bullying or they're texting or they're checking out the football scores. So how do we create a community? How do we co-create a community with our students so they and we come up with shared norms about when to use this device. That what we're finding in some of these schools where they're really getting their heads around the deep learning is that students are engaged and they know when to put it down. We never ever said to kids, pick up your pencil, put it down, put it down, put it down, put your pencil down, right? When we create a community that's clear and it's explicit and it's shared, students understand when to put the device down. As well, we create communities where the devices are just a part of what we are because we know they're anatomically, they're not going away. So 
we don't necessarily want to have digital in a very special spot away from the learning. I often say we never did march kids down to the pencil lab, right? <laughs> so how can we get our heads? And hey, listen, this sister, I don't have the answers on this. We're all just rolling up our sleeves, trying to make sense of how do we engage with digital in a meaningful way? And we're all sharing what we learn as we go. The trick is, with digital, is how do we move it so that it's not a substitution for, for pedagogy that's not working? How do we move it so that it's really redefining how we are learning? A word search on an iPad is still bad pedagogy, right? So how do we instead take some of the neat digital devices that are out there and begin together to rethink how they can be used? In Peterborough in Ontario uh, last year, I was in a school, students were in geography and they had drones and they were taking pictures of their landforms in their neighborhood. Like, who thinks about that? I don't. That's why I hang out with some of those people, right? And I want to hear and learn from them. I was in a little um, indigenous school in Belleville near Ontario, uh, near the border with Quebec. And um, these, these students were doing really exciting things. They had a go, they, these little kindergartens had GoPro cameras. <laughs> on their heads. And you can imagine these little ankle biters running around, um, taking pictures, and then they would tell a story of all the things they saw. What was exciting for the teacher was that they got a perspective on the world they see at two feet, right? And so, again, how can we engage digital differently? We're not going to get it right the first time. It's not going to be perfect. Go figure. We got to get our heads around that too. We are so not perfect in this game. And yet, so many of us who've done so well in school, we love to be perfect. So we just have to test, tweak, try things out, share our learning, get over ourselves and our need for perfection, and see how it goes. So those are the four elements. And we really believe, and we're finding, that when we're clear and intentional about those four elements, those six Cs have an opportunity to thrive in the classroom. So, another video. What I'd like you to do is watch this very quick clip from Finland. And think about those four elements that are on your cart. Here in Finland, we believe every student should have access to the best learning environment possible. At Kirkojärvi School, our building is an amazing and modern space, and now the way we teach is changing too. Using Finland's new curriculum for basic education, our school is becoming more of a learning community, where our teachers are collaborating and pupils work together to solve problems in smaller groups. Along with school's partnership with new pedagogies for deep learning, we are taking part in learning experiences much different to the old ways of teaching. And the class were really excited to start the Deep Challenge. In Deep Challenge, our teacher sets us a theme and we have to research very deep into that theme. We might not know much about it at first, so we go and collect the information ourselves. Climate change is a huge challenge, so the students first need to evaluate the problem and gather enough information to design a solution. We encourage them to dig deeper and use Skype calls with experts to find specialist information. This enables the class to interact in new ways, and it's pretty exciting for them too. It's great to spark the imagination of the class, and once the students implement their chosen plan, we look at the results and reflect on their work, even improving their ideas if they need to. They can share their work with me and the rest of the class anytime they want, and using Microsoft OneNote, OneDrive and Sway, they build up their project as they go, 
and always have a place to go to see their hard work. It gives us as teachers a clear picture of how the students are developing their deep learning and for me personally, I see their trials and triumphs right in front of me so I know where they need to improve and where they are doing well. Learning in this way, the students are supported to think about their role as a global citizen, critically consider information and to communicate and collaborate in class. It's enabling them to be creative and become deep learners, building character traits that will help them to go into the world and make learning an integral part of life. You're beginning to get a little taste of what this work is about. We've talked a little bit and exposed you to the six competencies, the global competencies, six C's, sometimes called, and what that looks like and how it's good for kids. We exposed you to these four elements, those conditions within a classroom environment that support and enable those six C's to thrive. But we know that they're not going to happen on their own either. That this work is really nested. It's nested in um, the need for schools to have conditions that allow the classrooms to thrive and those conditions allow kids to thrive. And so this work also has tools um, that clarify the conditions that allow schools to become deep learning schools. And yet we know <laughs> that schools on their own, they can't do it on their own. They need strong districts. And so we have district level conditions tools, similar to the, you know, the rubrics you've been seeing with this developmental approach that clarify what are the district conditions that allow schools to thrive, so that classrooms can thrive, so that kids can thrive. And we also have, if you're really bold, we have system conditions, and that's just the country. So I know that's no big, no big thing in the United States, but here's an example. <laughs> no big thing, but, um, but um, in Finland, They've embraced, they've embra they're a little country, right? They've embraced new pedagogies for deep learning. And so they're looking at those system-wide tools. If you're familiar with Michael Fullan's work, and it's a really good read, it's called, and, and Joanne Quinn, Coherence. And it, it really speaks to that we do need all of these pieces to work and cooperate with each other if we really want to create the best futures for our kids. And so we, we have created these tools that speak to each one of those layers. And as, a, as we've been saying, it, nobody's cornered the market on this, right? We're just figuring this out. And we know that perspectives matter at every level. When I used to do this work, we, I, would, I would say to principals and teachers, Park your position at the door. I don't really care, right? Everybody has a voice here. Everybody's views matter. You all come with rich experiences. Share what, you, share what you're thinking, because you're all going to make us stronger. And so it's really within that collaborative inquiry approach, that notion that we're asking questions. We're inviting people to take chances and be a little vulnerable, that growth mindset that we're really familiar with. And it's about continuous improvement. So I tried this, it bombed, it was a big bomb. Okay, now how am I gonna tweak it? Because there's some, there's some factors here, there's some variables that might have some opportunity and, some, and hope for kids. So it is about failing and messing up, absolutely. Adam Grant, one of my favorite uh, thinkers of our time out of Wharton, just tweeted the other day, you know the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours to be successful thinking that's out there? 
Well, he just tweeted, he said, you know, it's not about 10,000 hours. It's about 10,000 experiments. It's about this collaborative inquiry approach where you try something out, you assess how it goes, you reflect, and then you tweak it. And so it's that constant continual renewal that's healthy. And quite frankly, it has resuscitated so many teachers that they uh, feel, first of all, valued, and as well that they're thinking again. They're thinking again. Many of you might be sitting here thinking, okay, hold on, something new. I'll wait till this train has left the station. Thank you very much, right? And that's fair because, you know, education does get burdened by a lot of new initiatives. We don't think of this as an initiative, not for a minute. We think about this as an evolution. We think about this as a culture shift. We acknowledge there are a lot of great practices that teachers and leaders embrace every day and that we need to continue those practices. It's not a clean slate. You're not throwing everything out. How can we continue to renew and, and add, fuse some innovation with it? So this isn't about saying teachers are broken. This is about saying teachers are our heroes. Teachers are the ones that have rich experiences. How can we invite them to the table, share what they're learning and thinking, and celebrate that and build on that? It's tremendous, the um, excitement that's coming out of teachers. You might also be thinking, you know, this looks like a big wedding to organize. These massive projects leading to a demonstration and all of a sudden I've got parents coming in and I'm feeling a little <laughs> overwhelmed, right? Because a lot of the examples you've seen seem to pro um, project that it is some massive, massive undertaking. But we know that deep learning can happen in the class every day. Every day we can set up opportunities for students to collaborate, to reflect with the, their peers. We can provide open-ended questions to get that critical thinking going. We can provide them with voice and choice. So there's lots of ways to engage in deep learning. It doesn't have to be massive. And what's great is, is you, it's not as though you plan for 45 days before you do anything. You do it step by step, baby steps, and you begin to think about, how can I start to incorporate this into my practice. It's that thinking about small wins and small wins accumulate and build confidence and competence and people start to feel really excited about their work again. So we've got lots of support. The first column there speaks to those six C's and the um, tools that um, clarify what competencies actually look like in a very, very precise way. And we know that that is very, very powerful for leveraging learning for kids. The second column speaks to the clarification about what is meaningful learning design and pedagogy and how can we support each other as we reflect on what we're doing. It's a powerful, um, some powerful, powerful tools there. The learning design rubric that's mentioned there that speaks to those four elements that we've just spoken about. The third column speaks to those conditions that we were talking about earlier. What conditions need to exist in order for these, um, this deep learning to thrive? I don't want to show you all those tools because it's a bit like stepping up to a chocolate buffet. And it's all very yummy, but it's a lot. So we're just giving you little snippets today to give you a feel for what it's like. So some of you might be wondering what my background is. Um, I was a secondary school teacher, loved it. I think it's what I want to be when I grow up. Um, loved it, loved it. And there are so many things I now know that I, I wish I didn't do to those kids because you learn as you go, right? And then I, um, 
I was a school administrator. I love that job, that was great. And uh, again, tried to get this work going in, in some innovative spaces, um, especially around the inner city where kids need it the most, right? And, uh, and then I worked at the Ministry of Education in Ontario and there was a huge student success movement where we were trying to um, raise the graduation rate. And we were very, very excited because collectively as a province, we moved the graduation rate from 63 to 85%. And um, it was just a big, it's just a big camp, right? Big collective group doing this work together. And it was pretty inspiring. And then I became a superintendent, and we won't talk about that. And then, <laughs> it was okay. But I love this work when I was doing this as a superintendent. This is what I love. I introduced this work in, um, in uh, 16 and then 24 schools. And um, it, was, it was so exciting seeing not only what it was doing for kids, but what it was doing for staff and how staff felt when they engaged in this work. They loved their job again and, and teachers would come up to me and they'd say, you know, I was gonna retire. I can't now. Damn you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry you're excited again, right? So that's what this is about. It's about feeling good about our work. And so now I do this, and um, I've, I've been doing it for a couple of years, and um, what's amazing is that it's not this one experience I had in Hamilton Wentworth District School Board, just outside of Toronto, but I go other places, and it's as though we know each other, because we're speaking the same language, and there's the same level of excitement. People feeling good. So I, uh, I let that superintendency go. I don't really need to close schools. I'd rather do this. Don't believe me, let's, let's hear from some teachers. So I'm gonna show you a little video um, of Ottawa Catholic District School Board. So it's a, um, a school board where it started off with 16 schools, and this is very, very typical. It started off with, I think, eight, and then it moved to 16, and they couldn't hold the enthusiasm back, so they went board wide, and they've got 84 schools now, and they're in their second year. And that's typically what happens with this, is that you've got a few um, early adapters that take a chance and then they get talking about it and before you know it, it swells very, very quickly. And that's what we're finding is that it's expanding within these districts because um, people are feeling positive about the work. Anyway, th here are three teachers and um, they, uh, what you'll hear is from a grade six teacher and a grade two teacher, they regularly partner up to um, get their kids together. And so you'll hear from them. So deep learning for me is getting the students to be thinkers and helping them be creative and not just consumers. So it's really allowed us to hear the voice of each student, which has been a big part of our year. That type of learning has allowed the students to have voice and become thinkers. I think that's really important for our students is that they're able to dig a little bit deeper in, in what they're learning and to be able to apply it to real life. And that's ultimately what we want our students to be able to do. Now with all the six C's and uh, what we're doing like we did today, uh, it really gets those ideas and puts them in your head better, better than copying something down on yeah. paper. We know that people are not working in isolation anymore, like no one is sitting at a desk by themselves trying to solve a problem. You know that people are, are joining together, uh, looking at big world solutions, the world's a much smaller place. So as was said, that, that collaboration, that ability to think together and problem solve together is a hugely important life skill. I kind of personally find like a hard time uh, kind of communicating my uh, ideas, but when you're working as a group, it kind of all uh, is kind of easier to communicate together. And I think they're seeing their purpose, the purpose, and they're finding their place um, in the world where they belong. So that's really nice to see from a grade two perspective and from a grade uh, six perspective. We're starting to see, they're starting to see what impact they can make in the world. It's really fun because like you have somebody to help you make it. Yeah, you like working together with others. And, for sure. And they have more experience so they can help us. They're not afraid to take risks. Like they're finding out that if I take a risk and something goes off, that's okay. 
my brain's going to grow. They'll tell you that I have a growth mindset. Uh, I'm going to mm -hmm. approach the problem in a new way. I'm going to get. I'm going to ask other people. So that that fear is much lower when they collaborate and and get the critical thinking going together. At the end of this year, my brain's going to be huge. At the end, of this, it's going to be bigger than Albert Einstein. And we think those skills are, are what they need because we don't even know the world is changing so quickly. There's so much information out there. We want them to be able to take that information and do things with it, create new things or be critical thinkers about it. So what we're seeing in our students are what we're hoping will be the tools they need as they move forward. In grade two, we do like the robots and like um, fun, really fun activities to learn math. And what makes it fun in grade two is that we think we're not learning, but we actually are learning. I think it's that I feel like I get to really know the students as people. I, I don't think I've ever known my students as well as I do now because we're trying things in so many different ways that I get to appreciate them for who they are and all the different talents they have. And I've noticed in this year that no one says, oh, they're the smart kid because they're all smart in so many ways. So that student might be the good coder and that student might be really great at creating with boxes and creating something new. So I feel really connected to them as people because I get to see them shine, even students who have a lot of needs. And we do have a lot of different needs in our classes, a wide spectrum of abilities and, and uh, other learning needs. And yet they can all get in there and they can all show what they know and they can all shine, which is what makes me passionate about seeing that. So here's um, some of the early findings, and we are actively um, assessing at the global level too. We're also in a collaborative inquiry. And uh, we, we mentioned these things already, the excitement uh, of teachers and of the professionals in the practice. Um, it is quite common for teachers to say, I feel liberated, I feel valued which is pretty powerful. Um, we're seeing students, and I think you've seen little examples today of, of kids doing things we didn't think were possible. And um, Amy mentioned this, but especially those students that have been underserved by our systems, that they feel as though they are welcome to the table and that their peers are seeing what they're capable of and their teachers are sometimes surprised what they're capable of and their parents get surprised. And so um, it's really exciting thinking that maybe, maybe we're situating opportunities for each and every student to contribute, to feel value, and to succeed. <laughs>